on in this decade. Dame Cox already in town, checking out the surroundings at Doe Campbell, where tomorrow's kick goes at 2 o'clock. Big talk this week was about South Carolina sneaking up on the tribe, but keep in mind, they'll have a new quarterback, and the Seminoles have their eyes set on a January 1st bowl, which kind of defuses the talk of an ambush. I have too much respect for Coach Bowden to, to put them in a right category where I don't think they're ready to play. I'm sure they'll be ready to play. They've uh, got a lot on the line, Bo Scouts and all these things here, so I'm sure they're going to play well. They've played well, and uh, it's up to our football team to play our best, and that's what the college football is all about. In case the Gamecocks don't already know it, they are Florida State's homecoming opponent. And while Carolina isn't exactly your regular homecoming fodder, everything else is falling into place for alumni and friends. Don Evans takes a look at the fun behind the football. Florida State held its homecoming parade downtown this afternoon, and the marching chiefs were, of course, in it. But that's just one of a series of appearances they've been practicing for all week. Among them, a pep rally for the boosters, the music at the powwow tonight at Campbell Stadium, and, of course, the halftime show at the game tomorrow. They'll be playing Take the A Train and Jumpin' at the Woodside, two selections from the era of Marching Chiefs founder Charlene Cooper. French horn section has gotten together, and they have, have an arrangement of sentimental journey just for horns, and during third quarter, they're going to go to her seat and serenade her with just the horn section. That's tomorrow afternoon. Tonight's the warm-up party, the powwow, featuring sometime Tonight Show host Jay Leno. Tomorrow morning, the grads made good breakfast. This year's honored alumni, Henry Pollock, an FSU alumnus who's been on stage and on the series Webster the past six years. There is no point in being down about this process called life. No, and uh, right. particularly when you're a graduate of FSU and you have all of these homecoming activities, and then they bring you back and they say that you did good. I mean, that's beyond the pale. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gail Sirens. Sirens is the first woman to do network play-by-play -play on an NFL game. She will be in town tomorrow, along with Cairo native James Massey, one of Florida State's magnificent seven on the 64 team that went 9-1-1 one, and, one and won the Gator Bowl. After that, it's homecoming for former FSU baseball players. Then the Seminole football team takes on South Carolina. They won't see any of the other homecoming activities, but they'll know it's there. No, we got to win big. We need to win big, and uh, that's what we're going to try to do because it's homecoming and all our parents will be here and our friends, families, and we're going to show the nation once more what we got. Don Evans, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Florida State. Well, one more chance for Florida a and says, touchdown, Florida State. Homecoming 1989, a very big success for the Florida State Seminoles. Coach, you went into that 40-second homecoming game, and Florida State prevails over South Carolina. Yeah, we had another great uh, packed stadium today, home, great homecoming, and uh, we won 35-10 to 10 over a South Carolina football team that was very well coached and would not quit fighting. A scrappy bunch of Gamecocks battling the Florida State Seminoles on a beautiful autumn afternoon in the state capitol. We'll have the first and second half highlights coming up and also a great moment in Florida State football. We're back on the college campus at Florida State and the state capitol coach. That's what homecoming's all about. Grads made good breakfast and then of course the big football game at Campbell State. They couldn't have picked a prettier day. It was a beautiful day. Uh, Osceola and Renegade, they did a great job. The band, I think the band uniforms are beautiful. And then our cheerleaders did another great job, uh, all of the support group. There's old Lawrence Dawson there catching a pass from Peter Tom with us. Peter Tom had a great game for us. Lassane there, number 88 from Wildwood, Florida. Bruce caught his first touchdown in a while. There's a great fake to old Amp Lee there from Chipley, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And old Peter Tom finds number 29, Dawson from Dothan, Alabama. He picks up a block out there from Lassane. And there's Dawson heading for the uh, end zone. But uh, one of their defensive backs catches him. But again, it's a case of Dawson getting everything out of his could. Here's a touchdown pass to Bruce Lassane, big number 88, a senior. Uh, boy, I hate to see these <laughs> receivers. Old Dawson, number 29, is only one, only one of these uh, fabulous four that will be back next year. But Bruce Lassane catches a slant there from Peter Tom, and he's in the end zone for our first touchdown. And, uh, we, and we moved the ball real good. Well, I thought Wayne McDuffie called a real good ball game for us. He, I noticed uh, you didn't have the headset on in that ball game. No, I didn't. I, I, I told uh, Wayne I uh, wanted him and the offensive staff to call plays, and if they had any problem, they want me, let me know. But I, I just thought he did an excellent job, and they did an excellent job of good preparation. Our defensive team did a good job. Well, it was a nice play there. By number 47, Kevin Grant from Ocala, Florida, who just gets better and better. Odell had a real good game. I saw him around the ball a lot. Eric Hayes did also. Sheldon Thompson did also. And uh, Henry Ostrzewski, and there's old uh, Ter Terrell Buckley on returning a punt there. We got us backed up, but old Pete Tom comes off. 
Now, here's one where Pete Tom hits him, but we, we get hit unexpectedly, and the jars of the ball loose, and they intercept it. Now, we had more of that Saturday than we've had in a while, and I, I think a lot of so we just hadn't been able to practice a lot of hitting, Gene. Uh, Gene. Then when you get in the game, uh, the kids don't know how to take those licks. But that was a real fine sack by, oh, gee, where's the old 59 Keith Carter? Keith Carter from Miami, Florida, he's a senior, and with Kelvin Smith hurt, has played, started every game at linebacker. And he has just done an excellent job. Number 59, 45, Kurt Carruthers, who was defensive player of the week in the nation last wow. week in several... Uh, Sports uh, Illustrated and Sporting News. Yeah, uh, gr great. And uh, mighty, mighty pleased with him. There's old Usain again, catching a pass from uh, Peter Tom. It was, it was kind of uh, a situation where they were blitzing. Peter Tom caught him out there by himself. And here's old... Uh, the fake was good. I'll tell you what's happening. Dexter Carter's running for first down. <laughs> Pete, Pete, your fake was so good that everybody thought you still had the ball. And here's Charlie Ward, a freshman from Thomasville, comes in. He punted good uh, this ball game. They catch it, but they fair catch it. And there's old Chris Hall, number 41, down there. Uh, and uh, let's see, who was that? Ex was that Ross down there with him? Yeah, uh, maybe Stewart. Yeah. I think it was Ross. Ross. Ross and Chris Hall. Grady Ross from Jacksonville, Florida, and Chris Hall from uh, Melbourne, Florida, I believe. Big, big Eric. Coco, Florida. Coco, Coco from Coco, yeah, Chris Hall. Exactly. Eric uh, in on that sack along with Oliver Strickland. Yeah, six, yeah. Six of them. Oliver Strickland, a freshman, and big Eric Hayes, a senior, making the uh, tackle there, making the sack there. We had six sacks. And there's old Ronnie Lewis from Jacksonville, Florida. And he had a real good game for us. He, he caught 116 yards worth of passes and led our team in receiving and just did an excellent job. And he's coming along real good now. Uh, it's down towards the end of the season. Did not have a good first part of the year. I think he's a little burned out myself. But uh, he made some real fine catches in this ball game and ran well with it after he caught it. But Peter Tom is hot. He's hot. Now here he finds Dexter Carter, I believe, on a little spot pass. And Dexter, number 13, uh, makes a real fine catch out there. Look at look at Haywood Haynes in there blocking. Haywood Haynes, big John Brown. John's a senior tackle who has given this ball club some amazing leadership, Gene. I didn't even think uh, John would be able to play this year. And he has given us some man. Here, there was a third down and two, and real fine blocking. Who was that blocking out there? I, was, I tell you, Reggie Johnson gives you a good blocking. Tony Yeoman's number 70. Let me see if this is Reggie. That's either Reggie or, or, or Dave Roberts in there at, at tight end blocking, and they just do an excellent job on that sweep. Now here's Peter Tom throwing in there to uh, Terry Anthony, and a nice catch and a touchdown from Terry Anthony from Daytona Beach, and uh, Terry had two touchdown passes this game. I'm going to tell you, if you want to see a young man that loves to play football, look at that number eight right there. I, I, I don't know if I've ever had a player that enjoys football more than he does. I mean, Gene, he's the first guy on the practice field. He's the last one off of it, and he seems to just enjoy it. I, t I told him that the other day. I, and he plays that way. He plays with more, and he has got so much enthusiasm. If everybody has his type of enthusiasm, it, it would just inspire your team so much. Oh, there's Kurt Carruthers uh, uh, meeting him in the hole. I'm not going to say who won that battle. Oh, we just, oh, John Davis there from Pahokee. He's a pure freshman. Uh, nearly blocked that punt. Just nearly blocked that punt. Nation's best punter uh, ended up with about a 35 yard or two. Huh? Yeah, that's right. He, he was leading the nation in punting. He only had a 35 yard against us because of the freshman. There's old Dawsey again from Dothan, Alabama, making another nice catch. Peter Tom from Morris, Alabama, uh, makes a nice throw. His mother and dad were at the ball game. I know his mother and dad are proud of him. Uh, Peter Tom's dad, uh, Bill, uh, he was a student when I was teaching up at Sanford. Look at John Brown, number 50 there. Oh, a nice throw in there again to Dawsey. But old South Carolina, they hit good, they hustle good, oh, they're yeah. well coached football team. There's old, uh, is that Amp Lee? Amp. Amp Lee is a step away right there, did you know it? Yeah. He was a step away, Amp Lee, a pure freshman from Chipley, Florida, and I know all the Seminoles down in Chipley are proud of old Amp, because they're always asking about him. Look at Peter Tom, he's 15 for 20 already. If Peter Tom hadn't had five or six drops there, I think he had six drops, he'd have had fantastic statistics, they were good already. Because he got to but here's Amp Lee again. Down the sideline. Mike Tanks, number 68 from Atlanta, Georgia, leading the way in there at center. Mike Tanks has been one of our steadiest football players. Tony Yeomans, number 70, from Jessup, Georgia, leading the way in there. And uh, Hayward Haynes from Bartow, Florida, playing well again. And here comes Paul Moore, a sophomore fullback, about 240 pounds, from Miami, Florida, running a touchdown. Now, Paul Moore scored twice there, didn't he? And look at him on that suit. Good, good block back there, though. Kevin Mancini in there blocking. Robert Stevens, 
a freshman, Stevenson, a freshman from Pensacola, Mancini from uh, Brandon, is it Brandon, Florida? Tampa, yeah, Florida. Brandon, Brandon, Florida. And uh, his family had moved to Chicago, but I think they're going to move back. You know, Paul Moore can, really can put on the afterburner when he gets Paul's that as big speed. as he yeah, is. Paul's got speed. Uh, uh, you know, when he gets, when he gets uh, unloosed, you know, downfield, he's like a bull in a china shop, boy. Oh, there's another fine job. The pressure was on Ruger. Chris Hall. Chris Hall right here made a real fine play on that ball. Because uh, their man, they had great, they had great speed at wideout. We had to really respect it. Oh, look at Ostaszewski. And here's their touchdown here. We hit the guy's arm, and he underthrew the pass. Number 26 for us was in perfect position. He underthrew the pass. So the, so the guy caught it. We got kind of caught a little bit out of position, and uh, they scored a touchdown. But we really didn't play it that bad, Gene. Well, a good comeback by Eddie Miller, a very talented wide receiver. He came back for it and then just made the little loop and scored. The only touchdown of the game the Gamecocks could score on your defense. Yeah, one of their wide outs ran a 4 2 4 the other ran a 4 3. That's fast you get. There's not a slow one in that wide receiving core for the Gamecocks. From South Carolina. Two top ranked teams. Florida State's ranked fifth. South Carolina is ranked 16th. We got big problems, but interesting thing about that. Bobby Bowden does something different. Well, uh, uh, he, he does a lot of things different, but one of the things that he did different was he broke out the, uh, the white pants, which were 1-0 at that time. And uh, I think they finished the season 3-0, the white pants. It is a sold-out crowd. Bull bids are online. ESPN has got a national television. And Florida State's going into that game with big-time problems. Well, we've lost our starting quarterback. Uh, Jim Ferguson went Jim down. Ferguson. So Peter Tom Willis is coming in, and I think he played uh, an almost perfect game. It was an amazing, in fact, Sports Illustrated picked him as the player of the week. It was an amazing game. Well, it was amazing from the standpoint that this was his, basically his first start, but boy, did he start off that game right. Yeah, and you know, there was a lot of talk about the fact that he didn't throw ropes, and, and he suddenly was throwing. And he threw it on the second play of the game as he hit Terry Anthony for 46 yards and a touchdown. The defense came on in, on the second series, and Phil Corallo blocks a punt, and it is picked up and carried in the end zone for a touchdown. On the other side, South Carolina had a great throwing quarterback. Yeah, and he was uh, picked as preseason All-American for just about everybody. And this was unfortunate for him on national television. Uh, he didn't have a great game. Did not have a great game because Florida State decided they were going to rush three people and defend with eight. And oddly enough, those three people did a great job of putting a lot of pressure on him. And the poor quarterback had no one to throw to. Well, it was one of our all-time great victories. Florida State, South Carolina, 59 to nothing. Can't get any better than that. Join us again next week when we relive another great moment in Florida State football. Transportation for the Bobby Bowden Show, arranged for and provided by Astro Travel. Uh, it was gorgeous. The fans were out in garnet and gold, the corsages, the, the homecoming yeah. court, and the princess and chief looked Exactly. Great. It, it was a beautiful job. The, the university, I tell you, who put on the pow wow the other night did a great job organizing that too, Gene. I yeah. thought they had, had that very well organized. Jay Leno was there and yeah. a huge, uh, nearly 20,000. Oh, yeah, exactly. A band performed, a cheerleader performed, and the, it was it the Golden Girls also yeah. performed. Oh, yeah. They did a great, fantastic job. But here we are, back into the ball game. They've got the quarterback in the match. There goes Tony Moss, number 99, creating a little havoc in there. And old Kirk Carruthers there along with Bryce Abbott. Bryce Abbott from Tifton, Georgia, is playing a lot of football for Florida State and playing well. I'm very pleased with him. He's only a freshman. Peter Tom to Edgar Bennett. Edgar caught the ball well in the ball game there and made a first down. Peter Tom with us. That was old number 65, Haywood Haynes, folks, who, who is becoming one of the best guards in the country. I'm not a afraid to say that that number 65 right there is only a sophomore this year there's dexter carter running the football there's old brad johnson down there blocking for him peter tom to dexter carter being led by mr edgar bennett edgar bennett is our leading blocking fullback he has 68 what we call decleaders uh a dane, a dane williams led us last year in decleaters he had 47 this guy's already got 68 this year we're mighty proud of that there's old Ronnie Lewis again, back getting back in the ballgame. Look at Peter Tom here finding Ronnie Lewis. That's two in a row, Ron. Well, Ronnie's taking some shots, yes, isn't he? he? Is. I wish, they must not know about his bruised shoulder. But old Ronnie, he wouldn't flinch. He just kept catching the football. And here's a great catch by Terry Anthony, number eight. And he takes it down with a great job. See how, you see what I'm saying? A guy that enjoys playing football. That number eight loves to play football. Peter Tom throws the ball up. And when you throw into Terry, that's where you want to go is up. Oh, so he can jump like a kangaroo. Goes up, gets the football. Concentration is excellent. 
I don't think he had any drop passes, Eddie. We had some drop passes. I don't think he dropped any. No, he had, he had one. I think he had one. Uh, but I'm going to tell on him. Okay, Richie Andrews comes in and kicks the extra point there. Boy, some real fine, oh, some fine, oh, who made that play out there? Oh, that was, might have been Shelton Thompson. I'm not sure if it's Shelton or not. Could have been him, could have been, could have been Tony Moss. There's Lassane making a nice catch there for first down. Peter Tom Willis is back. He's taking a look downfield. And here's where Lassane goes up and gets the ball. Bruce Lassane from Wildwood, Florida. Oh, look at, look at, look at Paul Moore blocking there. Paul Moore from Miami, Florida, doing a real good job. Look at Lassane go up and get the ball. Amplee number 42 from Chippewa there. Now Lassane... The senior from Florida State University. Nice block again. But look at look at Amp. Amp Lee, a pure freshman. Chiplage, Florida. Mighty pleased with him. Look at Mike Tanks blocking. Oh, somebody else had a key block. And number 80 is Reggie Johnson, who has blocked magnificently the last three weeks as a tight end. He has just blocked excellent. They just didn't, didn't hit him out of bounds. Oh. Here's the uh, handoff to Paul Moore, and Paul Moore gets his second touchdown of the day. He's a load coming down through the game. Don't let about? him. Don't let him get a running start now. He's a load. <laughs> about four Gamecocks took a shot at him. Watch this. Oh, oh yeah. There's one. Yeah, so he's yeah. strong. He's very strong. <laughs> and football player. And he smells he's the goal line. Yeah. When Paul gets running the goal line, he wants that. He wants it. Isn't it funny how everybody mistakes that red line there for the goal line? They already in the end zone three yards, and they start stretching out for that red line. But, uh, oh, Brad Johnson. Now, Brad Johnson, I think we're going to have to let him have a shot next week. This week, after Peter Tom went out, we let, uh, uh, Casey, we let Casey get it all. But I think next week we're going to have to let Brad Johnson get it and see how he does. Because we've we got to get them both experienced, ready for the battle that's going to take place next year between Brad and Casey and Felder and Charlie sure. Ward. That's going to be a good battle. Florida State now with uh, their seventh consecutive victory, a 35-10 to 10 whipping of South Carolina on homecoming day. You get an open date this week. Yes, we do, and we need it very much. And we got Memphis State and University of Florida. And I, I'm really proud of the way these boys have come in here and won these seven ball games in a row. Uh, the, the leadership that they've had from each other, their enthusiasm has been great. Uh, people, I wish, I wish people wouldn't worry so much about us taunting. We, we don't taunt. Taunting is a 15-yard penalty. Our kids are excited now. They're enthusiastic now. You live one time in your life. Let them have a good time. And they are having a good time. And I want them to... Football ought to be fun. They're having a good time with it. Seminoles are now 7-2 and two and should move up at least one. I'd like to catch it in traffic. Under yeah. the Dolphins' schedule. And you begin to realize that Shula's shock troops have a lot to play for. The Colts came a call into Joe Robbie Stadium today with Eric Dickerson watching. And the Dolphins in gear. Dickerson hamstring didn't play. He was chilling and his mates were doing some thrilling. Jack Trudeau to Andre Risen. Andre Risen to the occasion here. It's the longest seven yard touchdown pass you'll ever see, but he gets in. Moments like that, though, few and far between for the Colts. The Dolphins had a 71 yard drive here and the big get play, Sammy Smith becoming the first Dolphin to run for over 100 yards in two years since Troy Stratford did it. Back in December of 87, Sammy. 25 carries for 123 yards, then Marino to Mark Clayton, 13 yards, and then Marino out of the shotgun to Andre Brown, 10 yards, and the Dolphins winning their four game, fourth game of the last five outings. Yeah. Prime time, some time, and he'll croon about this week's cover featuring none other than Deion Sanders, Atlanta Falcons, front and center. I've described this all my life. Missed it one time before because of Pete Rose, but we got it this time. <laughs> Damn, what were your teammates laughing about? The young pitchers when growing up. <laughs> Welcome to the NFL primetime. Let's update now the NBA scores from the... the ...the pass away for the... Nine seconds to go. Toretta looking toward his left. Gets the pass away, and it's incomplete! And the Seminoles have kept the Hurricanes out of the end zone and will take over on downs with 55 seconds left to go. Coastal clear and the weather is beautiful on Saturday as FSU welcomes Seminole fans to Doak Campbell Stadium for the first afternoon home game of the season. Florida State receives the opening kickoff and Lawrence Dossey returns the ball to the FSU 13-yard line. From there, Peter Tom Willis comes out smoking. 
the senior from Morris, Alabama, fires seven completions on the tribe's first drive of the ball game, hooking up with six different Seminole receivers. The aerial raid moves the Seminoles to the USC 21-yard line, but the lengthy drive goes for naught as Richie Andrews can't connect on a 38-yard field goal. South Carolina takes over, but goes nowhere as the Seminole defense forces a punt by the Gamecocks. We're at that level. I think we're up there with the best defenses in the country right now, and we just need to keep working at it and not not let down. I don't think we will. I think we're at, we're at our peak, and we're even getting better every game. Following the punt, Peter Tom goes back to the air and rifles a pass to Lawrence Dossey for a gain of 49 yards. First down, Florida State, Willis, inside, touchdown! Willis completes his ninth pass in nine attempts as Bruce Lesane makes the grab over the middle for his first touchdown of the season and the first score of the ball game. The Andrews conversion gives the Seminoles an early 7-0 lead. After the kickoff return, South Carolina has good field position as they begin from their own 33-yard line. But the Gamecocks can manage only one first down in the drive before being forced to punt again. Terrell Buckley loses two yards on the return and the Knolls begin deep in their own territory. Riding the strong and accurate arm of Peter Tom Willis to a 7 to nothing lead, FSU goes to the air again, looking to increase their advantage. But this time, the ball is picked off as Dave Roberts has the ball jarred loose from his hands. South Carolina has great field position following the turnover. But the Seminole sack pack erases that field position as they down Dickie DeMossi for a loss of six. Colin Mackey comes in to attempt a 49-yard field goal, but the kick is short and FSU takes over. As the first quarter winds down, it's Florida State 7, South Carolina zip. It was uh, kind of a mental letdown, you know. Uh, but you, you have to expect that as a plan, uh, the kind of teams we've been playing the last four five weeks. And, you know, it was kind of more like a practice than it was a game. You know, the crowd went really into it, and it, it, for us, it, I don't know, it just, we weren't as energetic as we should be. You know, we, it was just more like a job, go ahead and clock in and do it, and go out and clock out and go home, and that's what we did, and we didn't really execute as we should have, and uh, we, we, were, we were prepared for what they were going to do, but we just, you know, couldn't get in the floor the game. The Seminoles returned to the warpath to open the second period. FSU journeys 46 yards in seven plays, culminating the drive with a touchdown strike from Peter Tom Willis to Terry Anthony. On the play, Anthony spins, then grins as his six-pointer gives the Knowles a two-touchdown lead. Well, I think that was the best game totally as a whole for the group, and, uh, you know, I was very happy to see that Bruce Hussain finally got his first touchdown, and, uh, you know, Ron <laughs> and Ron Ronald had a big game, and, uh, you know, and Dawson, me and Dawson, we also contributed, and, uh, I think it was a total team effort because, uh, once the offensive line gives PT time to throw the ball, uh, there's no stopping us. On the ensuing series, the Gamecocks are again forced to punt and Florida State takes over at its own 32-yard line. During this drive, the Seminoles tally up the yardage through the air and on the ground. Two Peter Tom to Lawrence Dossey pass plays move the ball to the Gamecock 34. From there, Ampley scampers for big yardage down to the South Carolina 13. Ampley! yard line first down more from Willis he'll go well you know I'm happy we got back on track after the two losses and 
you know, we did go seven in a row. So that made, you know, that made the team come together and, you know, play well. The point after touchdown brings the score to FSU 21, South Carolina nothing. Down by three touchdowns, the South Carolina offense begins to function as planned. Quarterback Dicky DeMossi connects on a 15-yard pass to Eddie Miller. Seconds later, it's Miller time once more as the Gamecock receiver snares the pass from DeMossi and outraces Errol McCorvey to the end zone for a South Carolina touchdown. The extra point is good. And at the half, it's FSU 21, South Carolina. Open the second half. The Gamecocks begin to move the ball offensively as Harold Green churns out the yardage on the ground. But the drive stalls when South Carolina fumbles and Henry Ostazewski comes up with the ball. The Seminoles' defense continues to dominate on the Gamecocks' next possession as Odell Haggins introduces himself to Dickie DeMossi. Yeah, they was tough. Those guys fought us. They, you know, they fought to the end, and, you know, I respect them for fighting. What about the running backs? The running back, Harold Green? I think Harold Green's one, probably the best back in the nation. This guy, he's very good. The loss of seven on the sack forces a South Carolina punt, and FSU takes over at their own 35. Dexter Carter takes the pitch and picks up right where he left off against Miami, racing around the left side for a big game. Two plays later, Peter Tom Willis rockets the ball downfield to Ronald Lewis for a gain of 20. On the next play, it's Willis to Lewis again, and suddenly the Knolls are knocking on the door of yet another score. Acrobatic Terry Anthony does the honors this time as the senior receiver leaps high in the air to grab the touchdown toss from Peter Tom. Andrew's kick is good, and it's 28-7, Knowles. Following the kickoff, South Carolina takes to the air to try to mount a comeback. But FSU's ready for the air attack as two pass plays net negative yardage. On third down, Anthony Moss trips up the Gamecock signal caller for a loss of four. Following the punt, the try begins at their own 37-yard line. Peter Tom Willis twice connects with Bruce Lassane, and the Seminoles are headed toward touchdown territory one more time. Third down. Willis has all. Chipley product Amp Lee takes the handoff and bolts upfield for a gain of 26 yards. From the 12 yard line. Paul Moore bangs across the goal line for a Florida State touchdown. The point after touchdown is good, and the Seminoles enjoy a 35-7 lead as the third quarter comes to a close. I felt good because, you know, we went out and we did what we wanted to do. We won, and, you know, we're sitting pretty good right now because you know, Nebraska lost, and so we, I guess we'd be ranked fifth right now. And overall, I, it's a good feeling, you know, to come back from 0-2 and, and win seven straight. That's a great feeling. The final period is a mere formality for the Knowles as FSU needs only to run out the clock for its seventh straight win. South Carolina manages to drive deep into Seminole territory, but the Gamecocks can go no further than the FSU seven-yard line as Kirk Carruthers and Bill Reagans combine on the quarterback sack. The sack is one of six on the day by the Tribe, and it forces South Carolina to settle for a 36-yard field goal by Colin Mackey. The kick makes the score 35-10 in favor of the home team. 
The rest of the quarter is only important for statistics. Peter Tom Willis finishes the day with a career high 362 yards passing and three touchdowns as the Seminoles roll up 501 total yards for offense. Defensively, the Seminoles continue to beat up on the Gamecocks, limiting the South Carolina team to only 237 total yards of offense. The final score of the game is FSU 35, the University of South Carolina 10. The Seminoles win for the seventh straight time and improve their season mark to seven wins and only two losses. The victory helps the Knowles climb closer to the top five and leaves only one obstacle in the way of a New Year's Day bowl game. The last home game of the year against Memphis State on November 18th. They had one major item to take care of. Uh, if they could get past Memphis State, the major bowl bid was in the bag. Well, not to worry, my friend, not to worry. Somehow get past uh, the, had the, uh, was probably the wrong phrase, though. The Seminoles came in as 42-point favorites, just being, their main worry, just being mentally ready to play a team that was 2-8. and eight. As it turns out, the Tigers were so bad, the tribe didn't need to worry. 17 seniors playing their last home game as well as Renegade. They get a new one next year. One of the seniors, Peter Tom Willis, and did he go out in style. First quarter, 26-yard touchdown pass to Lawrence Dossie. Dexter Carter added a rushing touchdown. Then it was Willis to Ronald Lewis in the second quarter. That went 12. It was 24-6 to six Seminoles later in the quarter. Willis has all day again. How wide open can you get, says Bruce Sassane. TD pass number three is from 15 yards out. Then came Ronnie Lewis again. Willis will buy some time up the middle. Hit Lewis over the middle, but he doesn't settle for that. He splits two Tigers, and he is gone, turning it into a 59-yard play. That is the fourth touchdown pass of the game. Then, less than a minute later, the defense sets up still another score. Anthony Moss has shown a knack for this this season, the interception. Two plays later, Chip Lee's scoring machine, Amp Lee, will get the call. Takes it in on the sideline, and he outruns the Tigers to the end zone. A 51-yard touchdown. The score is 44 to 13 thank you but Willis isn't through still in the first half he hits Terry Anthony for this eight yard scoring strike six touchdown passes in the first half alone Willis goes out in style and Eric Hayes well he spent the second half mostly on the sideline signing, signing autograph Bobby Bowden called off the dogs in the second half 51 to 13 at intermission 57 to 20 the final Willis well he's within just a few yards of Florida State's all-time Total offense, passing offense, and completion records during his career at FSU. Peter Tom, I, was, I, I would sure like to arrest him and let him get the record because he could have got it easily. But we had already planned that he'd go one series the second half. Then we'd put him in there and let him come out and get some applause from a crowd. And I teased the coaches. I said, put him in. He's only one comeback away from, from the record. But, you know, this is a matter of getting injured there. And we didn't want to risk that. But... He played well, and, you know, maybe against Florida, he can get, Florida, he can get the record. After Dawson caught the first touchdown, and, you know, uh, other three guys were serious, and we were saying that, you know, the only way we could end it off was to make it sound good, that all, each one of us scored. And so we came out, and, you know, the coaches threw the ball to us, and we got the opportunity to, just, to score. And while the Seminoles were having their fun, the Georgia Bulldogs had a lot. See has gotten into the end zone. You put those fellows together, and what do you got? Florida State's famous Fab Four. And our own Stacey Strasen had an opportunity to visit with the Fab Four earlier this week. The Beatles, they're not one of my favorite groups, but, you know, <laughs> I can deal with them. Can you name any of them? Not, no, not even one. They, they were not a group on my uh, on my list, so I, I never even listened to a Beatles song. McCartney, yeah. Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. Something. Okay, those are the only two. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was half of yesterday's Fab Four. Today's Fab Four: Ronald, Terry, Bruce, and Lawrence may not know the Beatles. But they do know their talents are the ticket to ride FSU's rich tradition of great wide receivers. If I would have gone somewhere else, I don't think I would have ever had the opportunity that I have here now because I wouldn't have three other guys so close to me and so good that uh, pushed me to, uh, to my reach, my potential. You know, we really 
really sincerely care about one another. And it's not nothing that if we're playing a, uh, playing a game and we're hoping somebody drops a ball so we can go in the game. It's nothing like that. We have true feelings for one another. All together, if we can just put our, you know, all our bodies into one, it'll be one heck of a player out on the field. They'll help me out so much. We really help each other out because we all had our bad times, you know, and we just need they that'll pick me up and say, come on, you'll be all right. Just keep on, keep on. Well, it gives me a lot of confidence knowing that I have receivers of that, um, you know, capability out there. They're uh, super people on the field and off the field, and, and they always work hard, and, and uh, you know, they come up with the ball every time you throw it near them. Each receiver's priorities on and off the field may be why the four have soared to the top. Each stresses God, family, and education as their inspirations. What motivates me first is Christ, you know. I take that in perspective. And then secondly is my mother, and thirdly is my family. My mom always told me if, I, if you want something bad enough, you know, just always work and strive for it and, and keep God first and it'll work out. Uh, football is all, it's good, but you, you also got to learn that uh, you know, life is not always based around football. You got to put your, you got to put God first. You got to put your education first, and you, you know, you got to. Uh, it t teaches you to be a man. You know, I just think back of how far I've come. You know, thanks to thanks to God, and you know, just thinking back, you know, I can remember times we didn't have anything to eat and things like that. My mother worked hard, you know, to put food on the table. So I think just thinking about how hard she's worked really motivates me to go out and and do well in school and in athletics to maybe one day, you know, so I can, to make her life a little easier. This is not a selfish group. Uh, I think that the biggest thing that makes them unique is that their weaknesses happens to be the other person's strength, and they can draw from each other in that area. No, I don't have a favorite. They all have their own characteristics, and their own valuable. And then now you mix all of that together, and you got the fabulous four. I was thinking about it the untouchables or something like that at first, <laughs> or um, the bomb squad or something. But, um, you know, it's, it has a nice ring to it. It's just been like an opportunity of a lifetime to be part of the Falcon. Thank you very much, Stacy Strait. Here, the old. Uh, well, I can tell renegade. I'm getting old because uh, that horse right there, Renegade One, I'll call him, uh, came on the scene when I was a player at Florida State. He served 13 years uh, now with the, the garnet blanket of retirement, if you will. Uh, I tell you, I uh, was watching uh, as the uh, feature was being played and had a little tear in my eye for uh, one of the great traditions of Florida State, Renegade Chief Osceola. It's been an afternoon to remember, and I am sure that fine stallion We'll see plenty of football in his tenure, and certainly we'll have days to remember like this one. 51 to 13. More from Doak Campbell here at halftime in a moment. Corner route, catch his foot right in the corner of the end zone for Florida State's first six points. First touchdown, rather. Here's Dexter Carter. He would score from a yard out. Not a lot of yardage in the first half, Dick Carter. Only eight yards, I think, but... He gets six points right there and adds to his touchdown total on the ground. From the one-yard score to this one, it is Peter Tom upstairs firing to Ronnie Lewis. Lewis doing a good job of working himself back to the outside in between the corner and the safety, and Willis doing a good job of turning his shoulders upfield and hitting him right in stride. Bruce Lassane on the receiving end this time of still another TD pass. Tuck it. Oh, not there. I believe that was the reception that led to his touchdown. He gave baseball, and whom he left to succeed him. Faye Vincent flashed his own real qualities of good sense and sensitivity, putting the World Series in proper perspective when the earthquake came. Thanks for the Orioles going from worst to somewhere, for an NCAA final between Seton Hall and Michigan, two that weren't supposed to be there. For Pete Rose, finally admitting he has a problem. Thanks to the U.S. soccer team's unflagging spirit to make the World Cup. To Steffi Graf, no scandals, no excuses. 
only excellence all year long. And to high-profile guys who don't screw up on or off the court either. Or the ice. Every athlete should have not necessarily the talent, but the graciousness of Gretzky. To the judge at Westminster for selecting a real dog as best in show. To Jay Burson, who wouldn't take no for an answer. To Larry Bird, just for coming back. To Dave Dravecki, just for trying. To Tim Crumrine, for sheer will winning out. And for willpower, Tom Lasorda, no penance, but no paunch. To Jim Abbott, who refused to let others steer his ship of dreams. Thanks for fresh blood winning the Big 8 football championship. And Alabama's Bill Curry, for not getting mad, not getting even, just getting good. A big thanks to whomever decided not to make the America's Cup a yearly thing. To the NFL for unmasking the boss for what he really is. To Joe Dumars, no hype, no hot dog, just MVP on a team of world champions. To Jack Nicholson, who found work again because those Laker VIP tickets ain't cheap. To Sunday silence and easy going for taking our breath away without a word. We're thankful for seniors baseball. We don't have to cover it. For D. Dowis, the little big man of football. To Bango the Buck, coolest mascot in the NBA, and maybe anywhere. To Bo Jackson, the big man at everything he tries. To Greg LeMond, the American who stole France. To Art Shell, for the obvious and the overdue. Which Al Davis, despite that warlord image, made happen. Thanks to Nolan Ryan, truly the grand old man of the game. And even to George Steinbrenner, for not hiring Billy Martin all year. To the Hall of Fame, for finally waking up and finding Harry Carey. We're thankful Motoball still hasn't caught on here. Thanks for Jerry Cooney against George Foreman. Not happening this year. Thanks to the Pro Bowlers Tour. Only kidding. To Jose Canseco for driving an Arrest Me Red car bright enough so I can get out of his way in time. Thanks profusely for almost an entire year without Robin Gibbons. Thanks for a girl in the Little League World Series. Thanks for Field of Dreams. For Pete Rosell's integrity. For Chris Everett's consummate class and Kareem for being good to the last drop. And finally, thanks to the late secretary. Very often, we don't know greatness until long after we've seen it. That was never the case with Big Red. Though. Just one look, and you knew you'd remember secretary forever. And you know, we're also thankful to you loyal fans out there who scramble to the set every night about this time to check out the play of the day. That loyal group down in Fort Valley, Georgia for an, an example, and there are so many more. Anyway, happy Thanksgiving, crew. This pod is for you. And it's a pretty good one, this from the football game. We told you Chris Carter had some great catches today for the Eagles against the Cowboys. Look at that dance he did. Hauling it in over Everson Walls, who might have been able to make a play on it, and then there's a pretty good little step there, Chris does. But he liked that. He didn't like much today, but he liked that. Great, super stretch-out catch by Chris Carter, the team captain, the play. Uh, the Cowboys, they say... The Eagles coach Buddy Ryan and Philly's 27-0 win on Thanksgiving may have brought the word bounty to the forefront for the first time since Fletcher Christian led a mutiny on the bounty a few centuries ago. Dallas punter Mike Saxon, a day before the game, said he was aware that he could be a marked man. 500 bucks. Put a hit out on us. Take us out of the game. The player that takes us out gets 500 bucks. Tell me if that's legal. The game was chippy early, resulting in several altercations. The first following a hit after the whistle, the Cowboys quarterback Troy Aikman. Tempers flared, Eagle Mike Pitts ejected. On the second half kickoff, Eagles linebacker Jesse Small avoided three Cowboys and made a beeline towards Dallas kicker Luis Zendejas. Zendejas, released earlier in the month by Ryan and the Eagles, was hit in the head and was staggered. After the game, Jimmy Johnson was hardly in a Thanksgiving mood. Um, we were told last night uh, by, uh, by a coach, and, and it was confirmed uh, by two different players. There's a $200 bounty on uh, Louis Zendejas, a $500 bounty on uh, Troy Aikman. Uh, the word bounty is really, really a, a devastating type of word. We are an aggressive football team. We do, we, we do, and we will go after anybody on the other football team. However, there's no bounty. There is such a thing as a rematch in two weeks, and Zendejas says he'll be ready. Would you have gone after Buddy if you could? If I could have stand on my two legs, I would have decked him. And that's the problem is next time I can stand on my two legs and get close to him, I will deck him. If you had a bounty, uh, why in the hell would you put it on a kicker? It's been a six-week slump. And you hope he don't get hurt. You want to be sure he kicks. I mean, hell, don't touch him. Be careful. You know, that's that's the way you approach that stuff. That's, that's when it's so damn ridiculous. Well, I've only heard of one coach doing it. And, and I've only been in the league a short time, but in my short time, I've only heard of one team doing it. 
Buddy Ryan. And that's the man that we're looking at live from his home. He likes to carry it in his left side. Now, as long as he's got it on the left side, he can take a hit. There he switches. He switches to the outside arm. Something that Don Shula and Carl Tassif are going to change about Sammy Smith in the offseason, but that's going to make him feel good. Seventh play of the drive, second down. 228 has great foot speed, but he's really missing a lot of the fundamentals you need in the NFL, and that is learning with his Miami team what the audible system is and playing split backs and also being able to switch the ball from side to side because the guys here are bigger and hit harder. And as a first down at the 17, Miami in the midst of a good drive. Smith again turning the corner and bounces off tacklers. Woodruff and Everett finally got him down at the 10. But again, a problem because he's not in training camp, they couldn't really address this thing of only carrying it on the left side. And when you run right, you want to try to protect that ball away from the pursuit on the inside. But there you see Sammy Smith. He's turning up, and the ball's right there for somebody to hit it. You see, Dwayne Woodruff makes the first contact. He's able to hang on, but he's fumbled twice. Both times have been running right. Second down, three. At the 10, ninth play of the drive. No score. Five minutes gone by. And his first quarter could go to the seventh foot on a cut inside. Able to move to the uh, three-yard line. Thomas Everett, the uh, free safety, made the stop. Excellent job here. Good recognition by Sammy Smith. There's the Pittsburgh Steeler down. But watch the way he cuts back. Great running backs run with their eyes. You hear them talk about instinct, but they run with their eyes. Nice block up front. They cut off the pursuit. And then they're, he's able to cut back. Looked like Rod Woodson is the guy who got hammered right in the head, and it is Rod Woodson. And he has stopped. Second effort by Smith. He was not down, but he is short of the goal line. Last night, coming through, Smith is over. Touchdown, Miami. with his third touchdown of the season and very prominent on the sustained Dolphin drive. This has got to make Don Shula feel very good too because in the two previous weeks the Dolphins have had to come from behind. They were behind the Jets and had to really put it into another gear to get back into it and of course Dallas led them too so in the opening drive of the game Dolphins score in this driving rainstorm. And Harris Pete Stoyanovich the rookie from Indiana the extra point, Miami 7, and Pittsburgh nothing. With eight. A high position, just dives over the line and comes around the lead blocker. In college, block for Craig Hoover. And the return by Lorenzo Hampton. Out across the 35, and stopped by the man who held the football for Gary Anderson, Larry Griffin. And now you got some tough choices here if you're Miami. Dan Marino and Sammy Smith, and if you'll remember the hit put on, put on him by Parnell Lake, he gets the pass off. It's complete to Clayton. You can see the shot in the back. That's a legal hit. There's nothing illegal about that. He lands on his shoulder, but he does appear to be all right, although you, though you can certainly see the wince on his face. Nice stretch for Parnell Lake. Last week recovered two fumble punts. And came up with the ball moments ago. Able to lateral to Woodruff for the touchdown. Well, the attempt to go outside by Smith, cut off by Lloyd. It is a short pickup. We're down to 6.20 to go in this rain-drenched first half. The game now tied at 14. Buffalo with that 10-0 lead on Cincinnati with Kelly connecting with Reed. Kansas City over Houston. San Diego 3-zip over the Indianapolis Colts. Jets 10-0, Green Bay leads Minnesota 10-6. Second down nine, Miami from its 37. Hampton in the backfield, fumble. and a fumble on the snap. And the Steelers indicate they, they do. Have. They did get it. It's the nose tackle, Gerald Williams, who comes up with the football. A problem between Ulanek and Marino. And again, the field position gives, and the turnover gives Pittsburgh the real short field. Is it the rain? Yes, absolutely they should. I mean, it doesn't rain this hard, but 
They should know how to handle this stuff. I left split to the left. Hodge and Worley on the running backs. This is Worley. Hiding the hole and running well. That's the first down. Ted Worley stopped by the strong safety, Jarvis Williams. Uh, I think this officiating crew is going to need a lifeguard here before this game is over. Line apart. I mean, this is unbelievable. They're going to need the shore patrol out here. Punt, punt, fumble, fumble. Things are certainly turned around against Miami. Taylor's first down at the Miami 24. Worley, nowhere to go. Ran into the strong safety, Jarvis Williams. There is Williams in his second year out of University of Florida, Pittsburgh Steelers. You can see that the Steelers are going with a very, very short pass to Hodge. He just the running back comes across the middle there. He's only about three or four yards deep. But Bobby Bristol just can't get any spin on the ball, and the ball just dives right into the ground. Third down, 11. And Bristol going deep. Pass up. And the coverage is very, very deep. He dives to try to make it. Let's see now. And the weight. Yeah, he, uh... Ball this weekend. Phone's ringing off the hooks about the poles, and right? I, I wish I had an answer, but oh, we're on, sitting now. down, hovering over the wire machine, <laughs> and as soon as it comes across, we'll have it. Okay. okay. Well, Miami's big win over... Denver. And yes, Florida State could still be in it, but for the Knowles to stay in contention, they must beat the Gators on Saturday in Gainesville. Randy Ruditz talked with the Knowles today and tells us how they are reacting to the Notre Dame loss and how they're getting ready for the Gators. Less than a month ago, Florida State was the nation's hottest college football team by virtue of their 14-point victory over the University of Miami. Unfortunately, the Knowles may have cooled off a bit. FSU may just drop in the latest Associated Press Top 25 poll. I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but it is not going to surprise me. Uh, Notre Dame should go down below us. Uh, Miami, we beat them. They shouldn't go above us. But they, you know, what have you done lately? At first glance, the Canes' win over Notre Dame looked like good news for the Knowles, but a check of some of the latest rankings may shed a different light. CNN USA Today ranks Miami fourth, some two spots ahead of FSU, a team that decisively beat them. The early indications we, we're getting from polls is that Miami and Notre Dame, they're both going to be ahead of us, and that's sort of upsetting us a little bit and somebody's gonna have to pay days ain't gonna let us have it if someone ever don't like us so we'll go out here and uh see what we can do on saturday and try to uh make some people pay for what the ap's doing to us and if the Knowles are any angrier than a year ago that's real bad news for the gators however the pre-game banter has already begun where i'm from it's nothing but it's nothing but gators man when i went home on thanksgiving that's all i heard was gator bait gator bait gator bait you know what i mean i just ringing in my ear you ring it in my mind. And you can add to it that any shot at a national title for FSU, no matter how remote, depends on a convincing win over the Gators. FSU's taking nothing for granted. Whatever happens, happens. You know, the, the only thing we can do is win the next two. You know, and uh, I, I personally can't see us winning, winning the national championship, but, uh, you know, we still have a chance, and it's nice to have a chance. It's interesting to note that the last time this game was played in Gainesville, FSU won 28 to 14. Then they went on to beat Nebraska in the Fiesta Bowl. Randy Rudis, Channel 6. Sound and FSU. Mm -hmm. You imagine this game tomorrow yeah. will set the agenda for what these two schools can talk about for the next 365 <laughs> right. days. That's happens why every year. It is so important. But go. we'll have to wait another 24 hours before we can uh, put aside the talk and begin the walk of Florida State, Florida. It was a Seminole serenade as the tribe boarded up on buses for their 150-mile journey to Gainesville. Upon arrival there, the team partook of a brief workout before heading to their lodging quarters in Ocala. Bobby Bowden says his club hasn't been up for a game since Miami, and the question is, did the intensity reappear over the past two weeks of preparation for this game with the Gators? I hope so, because that's the big thing about being off. Uh, you know, one open date is one thing, but two open dates within a month We've only played one ball game since Miami, no, since South Carolina, in nearly a month. 
And so you always wonder if you've lost something. It's definitely in the, in the seniors' eyes, and I know it's in the sophomores and the juniors going all the way down to the freshmen. We want to be Florida real bad. And I think, Coach, we haven't shown the enthusiasm because we don't need to. You don't need to get, I mean, physically, you don't need to get pumped up from you. I always just feel like you want to play them. Kickoff is at 7.30. Tomorrow night, ESPN will have it for a national telecast. But before the foots, the Gators and Seminoles will get down to some hoop. The last football game of the regular season for the Seminoles was a December 1st showdown against arch-rival Florida in Gainesville. The Gators went into the game with a 7-3 record and nothing to lose but everything to gain. A win against FSU would salvage a frustrating season for Florida. For the 8-2 Seminoles, a win was a must if they hoped to get back into the nation's top five. A loss to the Gators would turn the Tribe's season from a great year to just another good one. This game was for the bragging rights for the state of Florida. Stay tuned for the highlights. This is Seminole Uprising. Five thousand one hundred twenty-four fans pack Florida Field as the Knolls and Gators prepare for war on the gridiron. The Tribe receives the opening kickoff and begins play from its own 20-yard line. On the game opening drive, FSU has little luck moving the pigskin against the tough Florida defense. Charlie Ward is called upon to punt for the Knolls. The Gators take over at their own 30-yard line. From there, they manage to pick up two first downs before the Seminoles' defense stiffens. The Gators run a reverse, but big Eric Hayes isn't fooled and makes the play. On the next play, quarterback Donald Douglas scrambles for his life and comes up short of a first down, forcing a Gator punt. who took the first swing, but a penalty flag was thrown at the 20. It looked like a guy in blue took a shot at Dedrick Dyers. Our coaches are on the field off the Gator sideline to get those players separated. Now here comes assistant head coach Chuck Amato out to the middle part of the field to bring the Seminoles to the sideline. These guys are fired up out here tonight. Following the touchback, the Knolls begin from their own 20. Dexter Carter dashes for 12 yards and the Seminole first down. Two plays later, Lawrence Dossie snares the pass from Peter Tom Willis and then fights for another Seminole first down. But just when FSU starts to move the ball offensively, a costly penalty stalls the drive and forces another Florida State punt. Florida tries to move the ball via their potent ground attack, but defense continues to dominate the game. The third drive of the ball game proves to be a charm for FSU. Dossie and Anthony are the wide receivers. Running backs are in the eye, and Willis will play bacon drop back to throw. He steps up into the pocket. I wants to go downfield. He's got a receiver wide open. Passes on the money. Touchdown, Terry Anthony. Seminoles burn the defensive coverage. And Willis gets reared back, and his eyes were as big as saucers as he saw Anthony all by himself for a 62-yard bomb. All right, all right, Gene, I'm going to tell you something. possibly 7-0, and Peter Tom Willis is now the all-time total offensive leader in one season at Florida State. He needed 59 yards to surpass Gary Hoffman's record of 1972, and he did it all on one play. Well, I've made it to my best game in my career here at Florida State, and, uh, you know, 
I'm glad I could go out against the Gators having my best game. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully I can you know, I can better my uh, stats against uh, Nebraska in the Fiesta Bowl. But on the next drive, it's Florida's turn to march downfield for a score. On a key third down play, Kirk Carruthers is flagged for a late hit on Donald Douglas. The costly penalty keeps the Florida drive alive. Daryl Perry will be the only running back. Donald Douglas has really hammered on the outside. Clinton dropped to the 35. This time on the third down play, it's hats off to Leroy Butler, who prevents Emmett Smith from picking up first down yardage. Butler lost his helmet, and now they continue play, and no flags are thrown this time. Now here comes one. A late hit on Florida, and not Florida State this time. And it was a dead ball foul, so that'll bring up fourth down. Well, Shelton Thompson came chasing after Stacy Simmons and ran him all the way toward the Florida bench area. Did not hear the penalties are just taking a toll like conduct on Florida State. And irate Shelton Thompson is penalized after the play, putting the Gators in field goal range. And I think what happened on that play was he took a shot in the back from Stacey Simmons, and I think that's what's got him hot. John David Francis boots the longest three-pointer of his career, a 46-yarder. And after a defensively dominated first quarter of play, it's FSU on top, 7-3. Coach Dobbs said yesterday to our team, which is true, Auburn beat Alabama, who's the second best ranked team in the country, and we beat Auburn. Last week, Miami beats Notre Dame, who's the number one ranked team in America from day one. We beat Miami. You know, when we're playing well, we're awfully good. Following the field goal, Florida gains momentum. On their next drive, Emmett Smith does what he does best as he darts and dances around the left side for a 38-yard gain. Two plays later, it's Emmett again, this time for 17 more yards. the three-yard line, Florida fools FSU with a misdirection play, and Stacy Simmons takes the pitch from Donald Douglas and scoots into the end zone untouched. The extra point is good, and the Gators lead 10-7. Dexter Carter returns the ensuing kickoff to the 27-yard line. The Knowles then go on a 63-yard drive, churning out yardage on the ground and through the air. This catch by tight end Reggie Johnson gives the Knowles a first and goal situation. FSU can't punch the ball into the end zone, and Richie Andrews comes in to kick a 27-yard field goal. The kick is good, and the score is tied at 10 apiece. With time running out in the first half, Florida tries a Hail Mary pass and comes up five yards short of the end zone. At the intermission, the two teams are deadlocked at 10 apiece. consecutive postseason tournaments. Florida State Baseball, 12 consecutive regionals, 10 College World Series. You can be a part of it by joining the team behind the teams at Florida State, Seminole Boosters Incorporated. Join Seminole Boosters Incorporated. Your membership really helps make champions. If you thought all Florida State fans have witnessed the talents of two athletes who had successful careers at FSU in two sports, football and baseball. One is primetime Deion Sanders, who shined for the New York Yankees and is now dazzling his golden abilities in Atlanta with the Falcons. The other is Ronald Lewis, a senior receiver on the Seminole football team. Lewis played minor league baseball this past summer for the California Angels after a brief stint with the Knowles baseball team. Well, now there's a new crop of the two-sport athlete at Florida State. Meet Terrell Buckley, 
and Kenny Felder. Both Buckley and Felder were highly recruited in baseball and football. Terrell Buckley's name is more familiar because of the flash he's displayed on the football field this year, both as a defensive back and as one of the top punt returners in the nation. Kenny Felder was redshirted this season and has been limited to a role as a member of the Florida State scout team. But as remarkable as Felder and Buckley are on the football field, there's a chance that they may be even better on the baseball diamond. Kenny and Terrell both are obviously outstanding athletes. For an example, Terrell can steal a base for us at any time, and Kennedy, uh, uh, Kenny possesses the long ball talent. Uh, the guy can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Last season, Felder batted over 400, cracked nine homers, and knocked in 53 runs in leading his high school team to a 28-1 record. The credentials on Buckley are just as smashing. Last season, the Mississippi native hit 344 with five triples as a leadoff hitter. More amazingly, he used his blazing speed to swipe 41 bases in 49 attempts. With those statistics, it would seem that the fantastic freshman would have no problem excelling as two sports stars. But there are some difficulties associated with being a dual athlete on the major college level. It's a big adjustment. Uh, it's a di two totally different sports and t using different muscles. So for a while, you're sore. And it takes a while to get into it. Just the speed factor like that, the pounding, and then going to baseball where it's not the pounding, but it's standing around and the explosive starts. You notice guys have a lot of full muscles sometimes. Uh, if you could give some advice to Terrell Buckley and Kenny Felder, who are both going to try and play both sports here at FSU, what would it be? I would say to prepare themselves mentally, because it's, it's, baseball is a very mental game, and that's the most important part. Both Buckley and Felder have enjoyed their first year of football, but both are anxiously awaiting the start of baseball season. Which leads to an interesting question. Which sport would they rather play on the professional level if they had an equal shot at playing either sport? I really have to choose at that moment. I really can't say right now. For now, you're just content at both? Yeah, so I just want to go and play both and see what happens. You know, it just depends on what the circumstances are. And uh, I just hope to be in that kind of position four years from now. They don't have to worry about making that decision just yet. They still have plenty of time to decide if they want their future to be in professional baseball or pro football. Right now, they're just enjoying the best of both worlds. For Seminole Uprising, I'm Tom Block. Florida receives the kickoff to open the second half, and Leon Fowler drops Tony Lomack on the return. On their first two drives of the second half, the Gators go nowhere thanks to the Seminole defense, which keeps Emmett Smith in check for the early part of the third quarter. With the game tied, FSU calls upon the deadly arm of Peter Tom Willis to move the ball. And three wide receivers on second down and long. Here's the little screen pass intended for Bennett. Bennett shifts the tackle. He's down the sideline to the 30. Bennett to the 40. Bennett to the 45 to the 50. Bennett down the sideline to the Gator 40 yard line and he's knocked out of bounds. The screen pass works as Bennett eludes a tackler in the backfield, stiff armed him, and got to the sideline. And Richard Payne finally knocked him out of bounds. But the Seminoles facing second and 26 get 39 yards on the screen pass play. We just wasn't pumped up for the game as we thought we was. You know, we expected to come in and, you know, do a lot of things against Florida. But when it really came down to it and we got on the field, we wasn't ready. I don't think we was ready and pumped up and as, and as enthused as we should have been. But as, we, as you saw in the second half, we came back out fired up. You know, we was ready to play ball. Later in the drive, on a key third down play, Peter Tom rifles a completion to Reggie Johnson, and the clutch catch gives the Knowles another first down. At the Florida 22-yard line, Willis with split back, Spinnick and Carter will drop down on third. First down, fires a two, Lassane at the 10, 5, 2, 1, touchdown Florida State! Bruce Lassane dragging tacklers from the five for the big kid from Wildwood, refused to go down. Gene, I'll tell you what, that was an excellent throw by Peter Tarmullis, but a tremendous job. puts the Knowles back on top at 17-10. It was a dark cloud over us, you know. We got to beat Florida. They keep beating us every year. And now that we won, you know, three straight. This is great. Following the Seminole touchdown, the Gators get the ball to their lethal weapon, Emmett Smith.
runs in a row, net 33 yards for the junior tailback. From the FSU 42, it's tailback Willie McClendon that begins to punish the Knolls defense as he carries the ball twice for 16 yards. But from the Knolls 24, Florida surprisingly abandons their successful running game in favor of the pass. First down, 15. Ernie Mills and Lomack are the wide receivers. Douglas pumps once now, goes downfield and throws it over. Everybody intercepted. Intercepted. They're going to say he's out of bounds a foot away. I can't believe it, but Kirby picked it up and went into the end zone. And the official's going to spot the ball about an inch out of the end zone. The Seminoles take over deep in their own territory. But a costly penalty against the Gators gives the Knowles a first down and some breathing room. Anthony was hammered by a Fijian Bartley. It'll be pass interference on the Gators. Two passes to Dexter Carter move the ball even further upfield. <laughs> First and ten from their own 42, Edgar Bennett gets the call and is stripped of the ball. Godfrey Miles pounces on the fumble, giving the Gators great field position. As the third quarter ends, the Seminoles' 17 to 10 lead is in jeopardy. I think uh, I don't like to make excuses, uh, but uh, off a week, on a week, off a week, on a week, and uh, I really think these people took the Gators for uh, for. Uh, Granted, or I mean, whatever you want, to, whatever they, they just didn't believe that the Gators were on the same level we were, and I when we kept trying to tell them guys, hey, they're gonna be ready, you're gonna walk into an ambush, and that's what we did. We walked right into an ambush. The fourth quarter opens with the Gators moving toward the end zone, but on third down from the 15, good defensive pressure by the Tribe forces a bad pass. John David Francis comes in to attempt a field goal, but the kick is no good, and the Seminoles have dodged a bullet. Leading by seven, the Knolls look to put the game out of reach. Their next drive proves to be a great one. Call it the Dexter Carter Drive. the yards through the air. Tell you what, he has been a force on this track. A sweep to Carter. Tries to go outside. He's got the angle. He's to the 20. He is to the 15-yard line. He's got a first down. Seminoles have won eight in a row. They're going after nine straight. Ranked number six of the country earlier today. Alabama lost to Auburn. Fiesta Bowl bound to move up in the rankings to do so. They've got to beat Florida tonight. All in all, Carter accounts for 67 total yards in the drive. Willis looking toward his left. Now runs out of the pocket, gets the pass away. Caught by Dean Roberts at the one. Roberts goes in for the touchdown. Florida State gets the tight end in the zone, and Roberts hangs on and drags a tackle into the goal line. And Dean, that is the second touchdown of the year, and I tell you, he caught the ball at the five, and he muscled his way in there. The final 10 yards of the 80-yard touchdown march come on a pass from Peter Tom to tight end Dave Roberts. The score gives the Knolls a 24-10 lead. With time running out of the game, the Gators change quarterbacks and go to their air attack. Freshman Lex Smith heats up for the Gators, completing four passes on the drive. Quarterback leads the Gators 93 yards in 11 plays. The 
the final yard comes as Emmett Smith lunges into the end zone. Suddenly, the Gators are back in the game as the Seminole lead is cut to 24 to 17. On the ensuing drive, FSU churns up the yardage and burns up the clock. Dropping back, fires downfield. He's got a receiver. Anthony at the 40. Anthony to the 35. He's to the 30. Anthony to the 25 yard line. But the drive goes for naught as Richie Andrews' field goal attempt is no good. The Gators get the ball back with a minute to play, needing 76 yards and a touchdown to tie the game. With two wide to the left side. From the 34, play fakes, drops into the pocket, now steps up into it, wants to run. He is going to be hit and dropped as he got into the 40-yard line. He gallops for five yards. Long count by Smith. And he slips down and falls. And he drops back to throw. Pressure coming. They get the pass. It's dropped. Smith's got to throw on fourth down. He needs 10 yards to keep the wall. 16 seconds to go. And he gets good protection. Has all the time in the world. Throws it downfield. And it's overthrown. Incomplete. Seminoles will take over with 10 seconds to go. And I think that's going to be the ball game. A fourth down pass is incomplete, and the Seminoles watch the clock run out as they enjoy their third consecutive victory over the Gators. The 24-17 win is Florida State's ninth consecutive win. With a 9-2 record, the Seminoles now have only one team left to conquer, the Nebraska Cornhuskers in the January 1st Fiesta Bowl. minute war and I feel very fortunate to win Gary Darnell he did a better job and his staff did a better job than my staff did and I did I'm gonna tell you his kids were better prepared to play that game night than my kids Seminole Uprising congratulates the offensive and defensive players of the game on offense, the award goes to Dexter Carter. The senior tailback rushed for 97 yards against the nation's second-ranked defense. On defense, it's Eric Hayes. The senior tackle worked overtime because starting nose guard Odell Hagens was out with an injury. Hayes stuffed several running plays and led a defense that held the Gators to only 129 yards passing. or professional athletes. Are we going to generate another billion dollars and, and give them nothing? Well, you know, I, it'd probably be a nice way if they could, a nice thing if they could figure out a way to, to do it evenly and fair. But as of now, the bowl games are great. It's a great time, and uh, it's just a great experience to, to have as a college player. Again, I've got mixed emotions. I said this before. The reason, any reason that I'm against it is because of the physical thing that the players have to go through uh, to play 14 or 15 games. I think that's very, very difficult. Besides academic and physical constraints, there are also some long-term television bowl contracts impeding a championship tournament. Steve Getty, CNN Sports. Joining us now to talk about a country that is not decided. I like it, I know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what. There is somebody out there right now, mm -hmm. perhaps even as we speak, yes. with bumper stickers coming off the printing press. <laughs> they are going to say Miami Hurricanes champions in 49 states. <laughs> it used to be you had to win the state championship of Florida before you could think about winning the national title, but the University of Miami 
has taken a different route. Sure, they lost to Florida State, but nevertheless, they have come home this afternoon as national champions. So say the Associated Press and CNN USA Today. It's the third time this decade the Hurricanes are taking home the hardware and the third different coach who's doing the toting. This time it's Dennis Erickson. First of all, thank, thank the people in Miami for their support all year. Uh, the Orange Bowl against Notre Dame was the start, and uh, the victory against Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, of course, was the end. And this football team is truly the national champions. Thank you very much. Oh, while the Hurricanes were bouncing on Bourbon Street, Notre Dame was peeling Colorado in the orange. The Irish knocking off the regular season number one by 15 points. Notre Dame thought it had a second straight national title in the bag, but when the sun came up this morning, the Irish were dethroned, and Lou Holtz was not a happy man. You can justify why Miami won it. Well, you can't justify why we didn't. No way. Uh... We played the toughest schedule. We had the best record. We were number one every week but one. We came back and beat number one quite decisively. Golly, Ned's, uh, if you want to vote on the best team, uh, maybe Florida State. Vote on who was the best team October 25th or whenever they played. To say, well, they beat you or you beat them. All I know is this, over a whole course of the record, we, over a whole course seat, we have the best record. Yes, Lou, but you don't have the best ranking, at least not according to the AP panel of writers and broadcasters. Despite the loss of Florida State, Miami gets the nod with 39 first place votes. Notre Dame pulled in 19, and how about the Seminoles? Florida State got two of them. Colorado slips to number four, and Tennessee jumps to number five. So, Florida State has a top five finish for the fourth straight year. Turned a lot of heads with yesterday's blowout win over Nebraska. Of course, it was those early season losses that kept the tribe out of the number one spot, but that didn't stop players and coaches from offering a self-proclamation. I really bet that if you ask anybody voting that has seen the seat, has followed the season, would say that today Florida State is probably the best football team in the country. Today. But over a 12-game haul, it ain't going to hold up. Uh, we beat Miami. We beat teams over and over and over again this year. And, um, you know, we beat Nebraska by a lot of points. And, uh, you know, we did lose the first two. But, you know, it's like people say, you can lose it the first. And, you know, if you, if you win at the end, that's what counts. And, um, you know, I think we're the best team in the country anyway. Well, the Associated Press writers and broadcasters have spoken, but let me tell you something. We talk about hot off the presses. This has just been handed to me. This is the UPI Board of Coaches across the entire country. Their poll has just come across the wires. Florida State is number two, according to the coaches. Miami receiving 36 first-place votes. Florida State receiving seven first-place votes. Notre Dame is number three with six first-place votes. And Colorado and Tennessee follow accordingly. So the Seminoles are number two, according to the coaches. And this debate will go on. You can believe that's true. Well, if you're aiming to hit oh. it, but you never know. Someone uh, may sure. find a way to start a rumor anyway. It became official today. Bobby Bowden will remain as football coach at Florida State for as long as he wants to coach football. Bowden's attorney, Richard Woods, drove in from Mobile, Alabama this afternoon to look over the papers, and we caught up with him. These negotiations have been going on for quite a few months, long before Steve Spurrier signed his deal at Florida. But there's no question the revelations from Gainesville created a measuring stick that simply could not be ignored. I did my arithmetic the other day as far as the number of wins um, it, here in Florida, and I came up with 144 wins between Spurrier and Bowden, and I checked further, and I found that Spurrier had zero of those, and Bobby had 144. Um, whatever Steve Spurrier's worth, Bobby is worth a tremendous amount more. There's no comparison between the two. And with that, Woods went inside to hear the FSU offer, and he must have liked it because afterwards both sides shook hands and called it a done deal. Okay, what is the deal? Bowden's total package will double from a reported 300000 to over 600000 Unlike Spurrier's deal, though. The morning of the big game was... It does. There's no question about that. And I think the, uh, the coaches and the, the administrators have to... Uh, do what they can to make sure that football is kept in the proper perspective. And I think the leaders on the football team have to do that too. You're, you're, uh, we had a standard joke at Florida State. Uh, coach Peterson made a mistake when he uh, spoke to us the first time. He said, gentlemen, as long as I'm a coach at FSU, academics will be number one and football will be number two. And uh, 
we kidded him about that a lot, but he, he, he really did mean that academics would be number one. I think overall it's far, far positive more than negative. There are a few people, obviously, that get things totally out of perspective, but this is healthy, I think, the rivalry where you come in here. People, by and large, are going to come in here tonight and have a good time, win, lose, or draw. Yes, I'll be very depressed tonight if we happen to lose this evening, and, but I'll get over it, and I think most of the fans do. We get, get back and we realize there are far more important things going on in this world than the outcome of this football game. But for a few hours tonight, yes, my whole world will be centered and focused on what's right, happening right here at Florida Field. Back out on the streets, along University Avenue, streams of people were arriving in Gainesville. Stores along the main campus streets were packed with revenue-generating memorabilia, T-shirts, and souvenirs. Cars buzzed by with passengers screaming their loyalty. It was now only hours before kickoff. The game, originally slated at 1.30 p.m., had been moved back to 7.30 p.m. to accommodate a nationally televised broadcast adding another angle to an already intense rivalry. As kickoff time between the Florida Gators and the Florida State Seminoles draws near, the phrase, just wait until next year, holds even more meaning to both teams than it did the year before. It's not just the challenge of winning a football game, but of winning one over your state colleagues. And both of these state universities want to be the best. But somebody always ends up saying, just wait until next year. The roar of the crowd at an FSU-UF game can be deafening, especially when the game is nose-to-nose. -nose. And that's exactly how the first half of the 1989 Florida-Florida State game wrapped up, 10-10. Florida had shown amazing strength, and the Knowles were just squeaking by. But nobody wanted a tie. Florida State gained momentum in the second half, leading 24-10 with only minutes to go. The last scoring drive, made by the Gators, brought the score to 24-17. There was still time for a tie, but by the last fourth quarter play, it was obvious who would win. It was a token five-second countdown. This time, it would be the Gators who would have to say, just wait until next year. <laughs> We've, this is our second punt of the uh, afternoon. We understand, for those of you uh, uh, back in the States, that it is evil. Used to making tackles. Watch Jones bring everybody to the middle, go to the outside with that great speed, and then just make good moves. Of course, he's only 140 pounds and 5'7". A real jitterbug, but look what he does against non-experienced special. Maybe three. Blair Thomas. Peter Tom Willis going over the top and overshot Moss on the far season. Had the coverage down the far side. Now it's a third down for the East. East does not quite have its uh, passing game in sync. It's uh, all the timing patterns, the out patterns, the corner patterns. You have to throw those before the break. And they haven't worked that much together. And those are the ones that are most difficult to complete. The easy ones are the hooks and the curls, the things where he's facing you when you throw the football. There's a look at the fluorescent striped ball. <laughs> the Charlie Finley ball for lack of a better description. Third down. Willis to the sidelines again. Stacy Simmons, the intended receiver. That pass had a lot on it, and Kevin Thompson was on Simmons, incomplete. J.J. Grant, the Michigan linebacker, made the stop of the play for the E. Intender covers that's here in uh, Florida, right? No, it's in Anaheim, California. Oh, it is? It should be here in Florida, though, Frank. Okay. Turn down the Super Bowl. It's all right. Your wallet may be telling you to pick the 49ers in Sunday's Super Bowl, but if you're a Florida State fan, your heart should be beating for Denver. The Broncos have served up a little sight, slice of Seminole on their way to Super Bowl Sunday with no less than three former FSU players. Scott Atwell reports from New Orleans. Orson Mobley, the big O. You'll find him in Florida State's book of all-time great names. Even though he didn't finish his college ball in Tallahassee, Mobley is still considered a Seminole, still remembered for this touchdown catch against Miami. Touchdown! I think it was the biggest play ever for me in college, and uh, it was a great play because all my friends was watching the game, and, and uh, yeah, it was like the winning touchdown. It was a lot of good things about it. Just as he landed on his feet after flunking out of Florida State, Mobley has landed on his feet in the NFL. 
Four years now with the Broncos, developing into a rugged and dependable tight end. I'm going to win an organization, and, uh, you know, they're, they're great. Uh, Dan Reeves is a great coach, and, you know, the, the te my teammates are great. I mean, it's just, I think it's, if I couldn't ask for a better situation than playing for a team like this. Among those teammates are a couple of former Seminoles, Kenny Lanier and Alfonso Carriker. Chubb, as he's still known, is sky high these days, and not just because he plays in the Mile High City. You'll recall that Carriker toiled for five grueling years in Green Bay, never accomplishing a whole lot. But this year, he's found new life as a free agent in Denver, starting all 16 games at defensive tackle. It's just an enjoyment I hadn't felt since I left college. And uh, I feel it again. And when I left Green Bay, I was ready to retire. But now I feel I can play, you know, five, six more years now. At Florida State, Mobley, Carriker, and Lanier became accustomed to winning. And that's made losing two Super Bowls tough to handle. By Sunday, the odds makers say it'll be three Super Bowl losses. The Broncos are underdogs by a dozen points. It doesn't bother me. You know, like I said, you know, we're going to try to win the game. And, you know, point, point spreads, you know, we can't pay that any attention. <laughs> we just keep to our own game plan and go from there. 49ers are 12-point favorite. Do you guys think you can win? I mean, I've heard that a bunch of times. And uh, at first it bothered me, but, you know, now it doesn't bother me. Every time I hear it, it just makes me want to go out there and play harder. The Broncos jeweler knows the AFC pattern by heart, but he's not yet ready to throw away the mold for a Super Bowl title ring. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports, New Orleans. A reminder, Scott to Carter. Carter went to the world champion San Francisco 49ers. It seems he's trained one winning program for another. I definitely had a lot of hopes that one of the teams that would pick me would be San Francisco. And as the time ran down and it got closer to San Francisco, there are a few teams that were very interested in me. And I, was, you know, I had so much confidence that San Francisco would pick me and I wanted to go there. I was hoping that the teams wouldn't pick me, you know, to give San Francisco an opportunity to pick me. And once they um, got the opportunity, they didn't waste much time. You know, they had already had their choice, and I was hoping it was me. And I didn't even really hear my whole name. All I heard was, was Dex. <laughs> and I just, you know, jumped up in excitement and wasn't very happy about going there because I'm going to a situation to where I can really, I can really play the way you know, God gave me the ability to play. So far, seven Seminoles have been selected. Here's the rundown. Carter to the Niners. Defensive back Leroy Butler in the second to Green Bay. Look at this. PT now in the middle of the quarterback crunch in Chicago. Ronnie Lewis joins Dexter with the Niners. Big Eric Hayes goes to the Seahawks in the fifth round. So far, two Knolls have been drafted today. Odell Haggins became the third Seminole to go to San Francisco. And Terry Anthony picked up by Tampa Bay in the 11th round. Run down some of the other players of interest going in the second day of this draft. Florida's Tony Lomack went to the Rams in the ninth round. Lomack out of Tallahassee. Mr. Carter and Ronald Lewis on the West Coast team. In the 11th round today, the Tampa Bay Bucks made FSU wide receiver Terry Anthony their choice. So far, seven Seminoles have been picked with Dexter Carter, Peter Tom Willis, Leroy Butler, Ronald Lewis, and Eric Hayes. Richard, you might yeah, say. I first, think a lot richer. Mr. Yeah. Carter, I, first thing I asked him was, what size Super Bowl ring does he wear? Because he's, he's going to a good <laughs> spot. You know, for some Seminoles, the news was timely. For others, the wait was agonizing. But yesterday's big winner was Florida State running back Dexter Carter. Carter was the last pick of the first round, and he's headed for the best franchise in the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers. Dexter Carter is on top of the world because he's on top of the Super Bowl champion 49ers draft list. I think to some people, I've, you know, been going against all the odds as far as playing running back at my size, and now, you know, the dream has come true. I'm in the NFL in the first round. The 49ers drafted Carter for his explosive and versatile ability. During his career at Florida State, the 5'9", 172-pound speedster compiled over 3,200 all-purpose yards, having his best games against the toughest competition. He averaged almost eight yards every time he touched the football. That type of player fits perfectly into the George Seifert system. Out of all the systems in the NFL, that system, I, I definitely fit. You know, with San Francisco, as far as throwing to their backs, you know, running out of the right field, returning punts and kicks, they want me to do both of them, and I'm excited about doing that.
The biggest knock on Carter has been his lack of size, but Dexter has been surprisingly durable during his Florida State career, missing only three of 48 games. His 4-3-4 speed in the 40 made him the fastest halfback in the draft. I'm the type of player that you put me in a situation that I can take advantage of my ability and size, you know, I can really, you know, do well. Of course, Carter is ecstatic about getting the chance to play with stars like Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, something he dreamed about as a youngster back in Baxley, Georgia. Oh, man, it's a dream come true because there's players that I've seen before I even enter college yeah. and not have an opportunity to play with them and catch balls from them. Hopefully win a Super Bowl here soon, you know, help them get better. And that's my goal is to help them be a better team and, you know, do the best I can for the organization. The 49ers also raided the Seminole Reservation, taking wide receiver Ronald Lewis in the third round, the 68th overall selection, and nose guard Odell Higgins in the ninth round. Lewis is a charter member of the Fab Four, has 4-5 speed and a knack for the big play. Like this catch against Miami in the 87 Classic, and the game winner in the 1987 Fiesta Bowl, and of course, many others. The 49ers got a steal in the ninth round with the selection of Odell Higgins, a first-team Kodak All-American at nose guard. At 6'2", 260, Higgins is considered undersized for an NFL defensive lineman, but should fight for the position. Odell should do just fine there. Now, in all, seven Seminoles were drafted. Peter Tom Willis is headed for the Windy City and an excellent shot at becoming a starting quarterback in the NFL. Willis will be a Chicago Bear and work under the head coach of Mike Ditka. The Bears quarterback saga, folks, is legendary. We all know it. Of course, there's Tim McMahon and now Jim Harborough and Willis and uh, Mike Tomczak will be the chief competition. They're the only two left. The job is wide open, so Willis should get a very good shot in camp. He broke or tied 15 Seminole records in his senior year, including most yards completions in a season. Now, for Seminole cornerback Leroy Butler, it was an agonizing wait as he was taken in the middle of the second round by the Green Bay Packers. The draft was six hours old at that point. Here's a list of all the Seminole draftees, Carter, then Leroy Butler, then Ronald Lewis, and then Willis, as we said, who goes in round three with the Bears. Eric Hayes goes in round five to Seattle. The uh, Seahawks are very thin up front. He should make that squad. Then Odell Hagen's taken by the Niners, and today it's... John Taylor, an opportunity to rest that time and have an opportunity to catch pass from Joe Montana coming out of the backfield, you know, and, and, and also run the ball out of the backfield. And Dexter Carter does want to run the football. Despite the size and weight of a gymnast, he has the determination of a 250-pound linebacker. Coming to Florida State in 1986, I wasn't as highly recruited as some players, you know, because a lot of teams didn't want to give me an opportunity because of my size. But I know that the size factor, you know, stopped me anything that I wanted to accomplish. I've had a great career here. Um, Florida State has been a winning team since I've been here. I came here in 1986, and I had an opportunity to play in a system to where I perfected my catching ability, my running ability, my ability out of the bike field, and that's the kind of situation San Francisco has for me. The other Knowles going to San Francisco, Ronnie Lewis and Odell Haggins, who went in the ninth round today. One other FSU ball player selected in the second day of the draft. The rough, the freshman class at Florida State arrived today. The big question was, to, would Toronto draft pick Chris Wenke show up, and how fat would his wallet be? Well, yes. He did show up and report to the football staff, and he also brought news that he has broken off negotiations with the Blue Jays and plans to play both football and baseball here at Florida State. Uh, we negotiated for the last couple of weeks, and uh, nothing got worked out, so I'm here to play two sports. What was the problem with the negotiations? You know, if you can elaborate on what, what you were asking for or what they wanted to give you. Um, I wanted to fit them in both. I wanted to play college football and, and sign a professional contract, but uh, they wouldn't allow that. And the money that they were offering me to not play college football wasn't enough for me. Of course, there are 23 other scholarship freshmen in this talented class. Running back Tiger McMillan, just one all-star in a class rated as the nation's best by many publications. Now these guys are ready to go to work. Yes, it does. It um, makes us, you know, uphold a, a high goal this year, you know, saying that we're the best recruiting class across the nation. We have to uphold it and show them. Well, Coach Bowden also got another bit of good news today. Offensive tackle Scott Shilbrack will be eligible for the upcoming season. The 6'8", 290-pound tackle was slated to start at split tackle last year, but didn't take enough summer hours to qualify. He's ready to go now, and his senior experience should be a big addition. Well, when Bobby Bowden speaks, people do listen, and that's what the members of the Tallahassee Chamber did this morning. Coach Bowden got the ball rolling on the 1990 football season, and as Dave Neal reports, it was more than just a chalk talk.
A fan in the crowd had a t-shirt that said, Bobby knows football. On the back it said, know what I mean? Well, Bobby also knows jokes. In fact, uh, my dad was a gold setter. My granddad. And I think it all started with my great-granddad when he came to the United States. Well, when he came here, after 11 months, he had accumulated a million dollars. Couldn't speak but three words of English. Stick them up. <laughs> It was an issues and answers session at the chamber breakfast this morning, and the issue was college football. While Bobby Bowden had all the answers, he told the audience of about 200 what they can expect from the 1990 FSU football team. I think the, tel the talent level that we're fixing to face is, uh, is, is as good as the talent level that just left. But it's inexperienced. we we got to start over. Coach Bowden has been doing this for years, and he says it's a great way to kick off the 1990 season. It's a kind of a refreshing time. You know, everybody's just kind of starting off wondering what to expect, and I, I try to give them some ideas in that regard. It's a great success this morning. He's a wonderful uh, public speaker, and I think uh, we understand what the program is for this year, and it was, uh, it was a fun morning. If the Knowles are as good as Coach Bowden was funny, well, we're all in for a nice treat. In Tallahassee, Dave Neal, New Center, 27 Sports. Well, the man who shattered the Florida State record book last year set his sights on some loftier goals today. Peter Tom Willis officially began his quest for the starting quarterback job with the Chicago Bears after a 12-day holdout. Now, yesterday was a chance for Willis to get reacquainted with his teammates from minicamp, and those guys didn't exactly lay out the red carpet. The Bears' newest quarterback hopeful arrived in time for the morning practices here in Platteville. As he walked onto the field, ending his 12-day holdout, the third-round draft pick from Florida State took some heavy needling from a couple of rookies, including number one pick Mark Carrier, who has been sweating through two-a-day drills since July 27th. Well, of course I wanted to be here, but... Uh... You know, you got to, sometimes you got to do some things you have to do, and uh, I just felt like that was one of those things. Uh, you know, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be a bear, and, uh, you know, I was looking forward to getting here. What was the toughest part of practice for you today? Uh, they put in some new things since I, I left. It was uh, threw me off a little bit, but I felt pretty good. Got Raz, too, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I always do. I'm not worried about that. Willis worked out at rookie camp up in Lake Forest for nearly three weeks in July, so he wasn't all that rusty, but with everyone watching him, there were still a few stumbles along the way and a couple of wounded duck passes to remind everyone this is just a rookie. How long do you think it will be before you catch up? Uh, I don't know. I felt pretty good out here today. I mean, you know, there's there's always things I can get better at. Will you get to play uh, this Saturday? I hope so. I, nobody's told me anything yet, but, uh, you know, I'm going to... It's a totally nonpartisan view. Uh, Florida State has perhaps its most inexperienced team of the recent Bobby Bowden years, but it may very well have its most talented team of all. What we've got to have this year to be a successful football team, we have got to have some unexpected help out of young players, some of these freshmen that are coming in. Last year, Al Lee was a great example of that because our starting tailback got hurt in one, before one of our biggest games with Auburn, and Al Lee comes in there and as a true freshman, only been out of high school about four months, Gains 115 or 20 yards against what I thought was one of the best defenses in the nation. Well, that's the kind of help we've got to get this year. We've got some real fine young receivers coming up. And uh, now the, the biggest thing, again, is going to be inexperience. That fabulous score that we had last year, they were consistent. They would check anything they could get their hands on. And now we only have one of those back, and that's uh, Lawrence Dolphy, who I think is as good as any of them. And I think he'll be one of the top receivers in the nation. What about the quarterback situation, Bobby? Well, we really got some battles going on at quarterback. We lost Peter Tom with us, who just did a fabulous job for us last year, breaking every record we had. And now this year, Casey Weldon, Brad Johnson, Charlie Ward are fighting for it. One of them has got to step out front and be that guy. I think if you ask people about Florida State, they'll always talk about the exciting offense. Really, that's what I guess we're known by. But you and I know that to win, you've got to play defense. Now, we only have four starters returning from our defensive uh, team from last year. Now, two of those guys are Kurt Carruthers, who will be a junior and our top tackler of the last two years, and then Bill Reagan uh, from Live Oak, Florida, a senior, uh, 
four five forty two hundred and ten pounds a real good hitter very dependable reliable young man that really should be one of the top uh, strong faces in the country this year you got to do a little bit of it all you kind of a dirty position in a way you have to do a lot of you know hitting linemen and you know containing the football you don't get to make a lot of tackles but you know you you got a big responsibility in the running game and the passing game as well you, it's, it's it's a fun position i like it bill an interesting thing about florida state's schedule this year is that uh bobby bowd somewhere along the line should get his 200th victory and if it works out perfectly that would come on october 6th in miami wouldn't that be something if it happened well, I'll, I'll guarantee you, if, if, if I got my 200th win uh, on that date against Miami, that would be the toughest 200th win ever in college. Yeah, football. and a Seminole band was there early, and I sure was glad, because that was a tough place to play. And if it hadn't been for our band and our 10,000 fans down there, I don't know, that was the loudest place I've ever been in my life. The defense, the defense played well, though. There's Bill Reagan's there making the tackle. Uh, our defense played excellent. They, 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 our kids played good enough to win. We should have won the darn ball game. Uh, here comes their fine uh, runner, Joseph, running the football. Uh, Looks like Johnny White's there. Uh, all right, Brad Johnson's throwing the football here, and, and we had an interception there. We were trying to hit uh, Dawson. We had an interception, and uh, their linebacker intercepts the football. And I think they went ahead and scored on this, yeah. Nice play there by uh, Dinkins, Howard Dinkins from Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, look at the tackle here. Good tackle by Marvin Jones. Number 55, you watch him. He'll make some fine tackles. He's a freshman linebacker uh, from Miami, Florida. Fred Jones' brother. And, uh, and there he is again. Look at him. Look at Marvin, number 55, make some tackles. Two big league tackles. Oh, yeah. There's Kirk Crothers, number 45. He's giving us a lot of leadership right now. Troy Sanders. Watch his tackle here by uh, Marvin Jones. Look at that. Mm -hmm. He is really playing outstanding football game. However, Kirk Crothers, I believe, was our leading uh, tackler for the ball game. And uh, then we make a mistake here. I tell you, if we hadn't made mistakes in that game, we made the two critical ones. One of them, uh, I called a, that fumble roost game. We, it was a, that's a chancy thing anyway. Auburn's going to take advantage of this. Yeah, they, they, I think both their scores came after fumbles and, uh, and uh, penalties. But that's uh, inexperienced mistakes. I don't say young because we're not young. Inexperienced mistakes that we made. And they score first. And, uh, boy, that crowd was loud. They had them. Pat had their crowd really working. Oh, yeah. And I'm talking about that was the loudest place we've been in. We jumped up. We kept jumping all sides and doing some things like that uh, because of the noise. But uh, our kids responded well. I couldn't ask for any better play. Our kids have nothing to be uh, ashamed about. Look, there's a fine tackle there by uh, Terrell Buckley from Pascagoula, Mississippi. A sophomore. I looked out on that field the other night when the going got real tough. And were, I don't think we had but one senior on the football field on defense at times. And, uh, so at least it's encouraging. You know, there's a good interception by McCorvey. And he picks up a blocker by White, number 45. Carruthers had a key block. I see number three, Leon Fowler there. Leon had a, a good ball game, had a, a, a key interception in the ball game. Now we put Casey Weldon from Tallahassee, Florida in the ball game. And he makes some uh, things happen. Good protection there. Uh, what's this great catch by Edgar Bennett from Jacksonville, Florida? Great catch. Well, we'll give you another shot of it here. But Casey Weldon's in the ball game. Good protection. He's got guy that kind of time to throw the football. But look at, look at, uh, uh, Edgar. he just gets better and better at catching the football. Now, Weldon is, uh, in the, again, is in the ball game at quarterback, and the boys are responding. Boy, Amp Lee ran well, but our offensive line was blocking well. We really, we had, uh, I don't think they made a first down from, after we fumble, they score. I don't think I made another first down until late in the ball game. Al Flea's running well. Our offensive line is blocking well. We got Auburn on the ropes, and in my opinion, should have won the football game. Except you can't take. I, I, I thought we should have, but Auburn won it, and that's what counts. And I think you've got to hand Pat Dye uh, and his team credit. They never get, never quit. And it, we knew it when we went to the ball game. You know, the game's not over till they, they blow that last whistle. So Auburn will fight for the wire. They did it in the Sugar Bowl when we beat them. They did it last year when we beat them. And they did it last night when this game was played and, and won it. Third down and six. Now watch Weldon. This is why he's very, been very successful. He goes back to pass. He gets trapped. But he's got the mobility to run for six yards in the first down. He knew where the down marker was. Didn't yeah, yes, he did. Now Casey Weldon, now I know people are going to ask. I, I'm going to move him. We're going to move him up to first team quarterback. So uh, people won't start asking, oh, well, what are you going to do about quarterback? And don't try to start a controversy. I feel like, we feel like Casey 
needs to be number one right now. Let Brad back him up for a while, and let's see what happens. So that 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 solved uh, right now. Richie Andrews kicks a field goal at seven to three, coach. Yes, the he defense did. is going to get the ball back. Yeah, look at our defense. DeAndre Clark there from Orlando, Florida, number ninety-one is playing good. The defense got the ball back. You're playing. Here's Amplee on some real. Amplee, I thought, he he showed some of the best moves in this ball game, and you'll see one in a minute on a great run for a touchdown after uh, catching a pass over 160 yards total off. Yeah, point. that's right. Now, see Casey. Uh, uh, Casey avoids rush and hits uh, Dolphy. No, hits Shannon Baker from Lakeland, Florida, and he makes a real fine run, another first down. We really got Auburn on the ropes right now. Here's another. Well, there's a the handout. Look at Amp. Look at Amp. Make them miss him. Mm -hmm. But, gee, our offensive line, look at Robert Stevenson there blocking so well. Stevenson's played so well. Robbie Baker plays so well. Another nice catch by Shannon Baker of uh, Lakeland, Florida. Dolphy there uh, from Dothan, Alabama, uh, uh, helping out. Here comes Dolphy in, in motion. Look at Amp running the ball there. Boy, right down to the goal line. And uh, Edgar uh, Bennett takes it over after this play. Well, look at that. Well, look at that blocking by Kevin Mancini. That was a great block out there. And, and also by Reggie uh, Johnson and, and, and uh, Dave Roberts. Look at the offensive line, though. Look at that offensive Mancini line. Just cleaned it out, didn't exactly. Warren Hart there from Jacksonville, Florida, number 84, played some of that tight end. Uh, and so Marvin Farrell from Jacksonville, Florida, was injured this last week and couldn't play. Somebody will take the lead, Coach. Yeah, we take a 10 to 7 lead, and really from that point on until the last uh, three minutes of the game, we had complete uh, uh, control of the ball game. There's uh, uh, Casey hitting amply on a pass here, and uh, here's a fake, and here's this is a touchdown here. No, that One was more a, play. a run for the first down. This next play is a touchdown. Right here. Amp, uh, amply, uh, Casey will ever take the football. Takes the ball to Amp, and then throws him a screen pass, and he picks up a good block out there by uh, his guard, and he just runs for a touchdown. Now, you know, we say Amp's not fast, but he ran all the Auburn boys there for a touchdown. And we got a 17 to 7 lead now, and it holds up until what, the last five minutes of the game? Here's but, those blocks, Coach. Yeah, oh, about. a real fine block. Uh, number 60 there, Mike Morris from Miami, Florida, blocking. Uh, I tell you, who else did a good job, too, was Matt Pryor from, from Live Oak. He had a big block on him. He had a big block. And uh, Richie Andrews, who was captain of our specialty team, kicked the uh, extra point and the field goal, and we got a 17-7 league. Our kids are playing great. 17-7. Casey Weldon's got the ha hot hand. Ampley's doing some big things with the football, but there's still another half of football yet to come. Darn it. In between now and the second half highlights, Burt Reynolds and Vic Frenzy. Well, later on, Dave Capellan kicks a field goal. Of it extends that lead 10 to nothing. Second quarter, then Seminole defense takes over. Of course, one of your favorites uh, was just coming into his own then, too. That's right, the national tag team champion. <laughs> Ron Simmons was unbelievable in that game. Larry King also having a, a, a great second half, too, with uh, 39 yards. Uh, had a 29-yard run, and I guess the keys were rattling in the half. And we moved into the uh, the top 20 with that win. That was the first time we'd been in the top 20 quarter was that field goal there by Von Weil. And you go to the fourth quarter with a seven-point lead. Yeah, let's change subjects. Let's talk about people. <laughs> they, try, they try one of their rooskies, and uh, we intercepted uh, John Davis from Pahokee, Florida, intercepted. Uh, he's a sophomore and uh, gets us up. Good field. Now, here, we had a chance to win it right here. We had a good ch a chance to win it right here. We took the ball in. We did move it some, and we hit a pass. Uh, oh, goodness. We just... See, Casey, Casey did a good job running for some first downs. Uh, and uh, oh, this was the Rooski right Ruski. here. Uh, here's the Rooski right here. Boy, we had a great play. We would have really fooled him. Except one, one guy spotted it, and uh, he recovered it. Made, now, they take this thing and drive for a touchdown. Now, remember, they still got 60-something yards to go. It's not like that mm -hmm. play right there was the one that just did us in. But they, they did what they had to do. They made some great catches. It's number 20 for them. Herbert Casey. Oh, he made some great catches. I, I, I didn't, didn't know he was that good, but he made some great catches. And uh, our defense played Johnny White uh, making the play there. Johnny from uh, uh, Thomasville, Georgia. Oh, he just runs over us there. Oh, we missed tackles. Takes it down the goal line. We missed tackles. But we missed them right here. We missed them here. Nice uh, play by Auburn. Auburn, Auburn might be one of the best. I know they're one of the best in the nation. Yeah. Are they the best? I don't know. We'll no. have to wait and see. They'll move up to number three at least. Yeah, I yeah. We, we should have gained some confidence, though, because we go right into their backyard. They had every intangible reason to win the ball game. Crowd, atmosphere, home game, everything. Noise and everything else. And we outplayed them. We should have. We. I wish we'd have won. I, I, when you lose, you lose. There's Dawson. Is that Dawson catching the ball over the middle there? That might have been just shy of a first down. I'm just not shy. sure. And this, this, 
a tie. A tie is a play that, 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 that yeah. See, we could, we could have punted there and got a tie. But uh, we decided to go for it. The boys wanted to go for it. The coaches asked our coaches how they felt about it. We all felt like we ought to go for it. Now, they, they take the ball and come back and kick the field goal that, that beats us. So you got to give them credit. I hope I don't pull them out too much because Auburn deserved to win the ball game also. Von Lyle kicks the game winner, a 38-yard field goal with two seconds left, and that was it. Final score, Auburn 20, Florida State 17. Ahead, the Seminoles take on the LSU Bengal Tigers. A closing comment coming up in just a moment. Marching Chiefs of FSU, one of the best marching bands in America, coming up at halftime. And now you see that cheerleader. You're supposed to say, hey, Dad. We get eight. The football players say hi. Hey, Mom. Now somebody's got to say hi to Dad. Third down five from the 48-yard line of the Seminoles. Possession play for Southern Miss. Barr rifles it over the middle. It is picked off. The errant pass was picked off at the 28-yard line. It was intended for Michael Jackson. It was Dedrick Dodge, the only returning secondary member with his first interception of the year, number 28. Well, sometimes when you got a big arm like Brett Favre, it'll get you in trouble. That time he tries to lay it in there, he doesn't finish the throw, the ball flies on him, and the blade makes the stab. The third turnover, that's the first interception in a long time for Brett Favre. On his second play from scrimmage last year, Deion Sanders picked him off. He had thrown 160 passes without an interception till then. Roberts with the grab out at the 35-yard line. But that interception was simply an overthrown ball on the part of Favre. Dodge came up with it, but it was thrown right at him. Third turnover, two fumbles by Southern Miss, and that interception. And all of them drive stopping. From the 36-yard line, this will be second down and three. Dexter Carter, big hole. Southern Miss ball at the 38-yard line. Kerry Bowery picked it up on the good hop. It was knocked out of there by Simi Carter. It's, I don't want it. You take it. It's too hot for me time. Semi nails him right before he gets that. He nails him while he's planted, and he gets a he gets a handful of them. Puts that hat right on a ball, and here it comes. Big hit by Semi Carter. Gary Valerie there to pick up the scraps. Second Florida State fumble. Two fumbles by Southern Miss. An interception. Five turnovers in this ballgame. First and ten from the 39. Going the other way. On the draw. Warnsley. Nothing going this time. The Seminoles starting to sense that play. Odell Hagens who had penetrated, beaten his men, combines with Joe Ostazuski. Clock ticking down in the bottom right, minute 47 to go in the half. Would Curly Hallman be uh, insulted if I said he has kind of a Pat Dye look the way he wears his cap? You know, I'm, I think Pat was probably at Alabama. I think they were there together. So, I don't think he'd be insulted. Well, okay, he has a I Pat Dye look. I think he's got a Jackie Sherrill look myself. So, good point. Second down, 11. It is complete to Raul. Breaks the tackle. Raul to the 17-yard line. Leroy Butler hauls him down. That was a gain of 44 yards. Well, he got the last one he threw in there, picked off. That doesn't slow him down. Whack. Drills it right down the middle. Raul beats the tackle. Dodge can't hold on. And now it's just a race to the end zone. Great hustle by Leroy Butler again. Another get Touchdown saving tackle. The Southern Miss faithful, and there aren't a lot of them in the Gator Bowl here today. 
traveled over from Hattiesburg are on their feet on first down and 10. To the left side, Bradley drives inside the 15. 56 seconds remaining in the first half. It's tied at 10, and these Golden Eagles have given the Seminoles all and more than they can handle. They got their receivers coming into the game now, Bob. Uh, Greg Reed coming into the football game, and both their backs that catch the ball well, Warnsley and Eddie Ray Jackson in the game. On a second down seven, tied at 10. Barr. Plenty of time. Dumps it over the middle. Almost picked off by Carruthers. Wanted to get it to Eddie Ray Jackson. Threw it in some serious traffic in there. Almost like a shovel pass there. Jackson trying to get inside position on Kurt Carruthers, and Carruthers did a great job trying to work from that short side of the field, getting, getting to that wide side of the field. Good job by uh, Kurt Carruthers. A sophomore, a guy that came in really too light at... Uh, 200 pounds out of Lansing, Michigan. Tim, with this amount of time left, 26 seconds quickly, you, on the third down and long, do you take it to the end zone, and then go for the field goal, or just the first down? Try to get into the end zone. Warnsley gets a beautiful block and drives to the three and a half, and he almost got into the end zone, and the clock down to 18 seconds. Just a little swing pass to the fullback Warnsley. A real good block by 6'8", 270-pound Chris Riles, number 78 on the right side. Great call by Jeff Bauer. We'll be right back. There's a motor oil that talks about quality, always has, always will. Well, Valvoline makes the highest quality motor oil recommended by any automobile manufacturer. Oh, yeah. Unlike the competition, Valvoline also makes the motor oil used by 7 out of 10 Indy 500 crew chiefs. That's 7 out of 10 Indy crew chiefs over the last 10 years. People who know, use Valvoline. Do you think they'll ever open? Hey. I don't think it's going to be long now. The ref is right on top of the plate. He was traveling. No way. I can't wait. I can't wait till we get him. Really? Can you believe it? 3rd and 3, and a guy goes off pack. The 86 series was the greatest <laughs> ever. What are you, crazy? What about 75? Hey, the line's moving. <laughs> yeah, you're behind me. There's only one place real fans go to get their favorite brand of themed sportswear. The Nutmeg Athletic Department. Your eyes are not deceiving you. It is tied at 10, and that tie may be broken. Look at this catch. Just a little quick screen out here to Warnsley. Does a nice job of controlling the ball, putting away, and now it's upfield. Florida State in, in, a, in a zone look, trying to converge on the ball, but a good game by Warnsley, a first and four at the Seminole four-yard line. You get the view from the end zone here at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. Temperature in the low 90s, 18 seconds to go in the first half. First and goal from the four. Barb, quick toss, looking for Raul in the end zone. And he was hit right after the ball got there. A hard hit by Corey and Freeman. And jolted it loose. Intended for Raul. You know, Mickey Andrews, were, we were in his office the other day, and we were talking about that pattern in particular, the fade. It's such a tough thing for a defensive back because of the lateral stretch there. He gets there just as the ball gets there, or that would have been pass interference. They would have called it the face masking or something. It's such a difficult thing for the defensive back to get his head cranked back around to make it at least look like he's playing the football. Raul and Williams are the receivers. Second down goal. Quick toss this time looking for Williams. Touchdown! Leroy Butler is arguing, but to no avail, the Southern Miss Golden Eagles have scored. The senior from Meridian, Mississippi, Alfred Williams with the grab. Chuck Davis is in for the point after. The Seminole fans are stunned. The ones here at the Gator Bowl and the ones around the country. And the Southern Miss folks are saying, we told you we were good.
conversion is good. It is 17 to 10 Southern Miss with only 11 seconds to go in the half. The wide side of the field is to the right on your screen. And Favre throws it back into the short side of the field. Throws it over the outside shoulder. Leroy Butler thinks he was out of bounds. Let's see if we can see it here. Good adjustment on the ball, and it looked like he was out of bounds. You bet. We... They called Tillman in on a reception on the near sideline that didn't look in bounds, and his foot was definitely out of bounds. It was pretty clear. He stepped on the white. The white says it's out of bounds. That's why there's the green grass and then the thick border of white. If you touch the white, you are out of bounds. That's why it's easier to call. Nevertheless, it's 17-10. Good rotation, good catch, and uh, his left foot clearly out of bounds. And uh, those things happen. And they're going to happen for you, and they're going to happen against you. And you just got to overcome them when they happen for you. Or when, when they happen against you. Bobby Bowden's got to be concerned about this. You, you know what he's concerned mostly about is the Golden Eagles' ability to move the football on his defense. I think that Florida State can move it down the field at will when they start uncranking that passing game. The kickoff coming down to Lawrence Dossie at the nine. Can he get outside? No, down to the 24-yard line with five seconds left in the half. Gerald Blake with the tackle for Southern Miss. This was a well-executed scoring drive on the part of Southern Miss. Seven plays, 61 yards, and only a minute 51. Favre's numbers, 11 out of 21 for 184 yards, one TD, one interception here. And one of the things that's making it work for him, Bob, is their ability to stay out of those second and long situations. And that's what Jeff Bauer was concerned about before the game. Felt like if they got dominated on first down, they were in big trouble. If they had to throw the ball on Florida State, then they, they were in a big mess. Florida State has five seconds. The ball at the 24-yard line. They're just going to run it out. This is Chris Parker, the sophomore running back. Who runs out of bounds, but after the clock winds down to triple zeros, and Southern Miss with an upset in the making, 17 to 10, leading fifth-ranked Florida State in the season opener for both.